Welcome to this episode of Brands and Marketing. For those uh, young men and women who are considering marketing and brands as a career option to specialize in, uh, I would recommend a book, unless you've already read it, by Ted Levitt. Now, Levitt was the editor of Harvard Business Review. And he wrote several books, but amongst his classics is Marketing Imagination. And in Marketing Imagination, Levitt says that uh, marketing is the guts of any business because marketing and brands create and retain consumers at a financial surplus, which makes sustainable businesses. Now, this sounds very simple and very elegantly put by Levitt, but it's a very complex process. Now, if you look at the Indian markets over the last several years, we have seen some robust growth, some very, very large brands being built in the process and pretty large businesses which uh, came to be over the last 15 to 20 years. But as we speak, Indian markets are facing uh, some serious headwinds. Businesses are uh, having challenges, except a few sectors, of course. and. Uh, uh, people are now trying to wrap their heads around uh, what solutions they could come up with so that they can put the fuel back into the business and go back to some high growth. To discuss all this, uh, my guest is a person who has uh, had a fascinating journey over a very long period of time. And he has some very interesting ideas around this. My guest is Bharat Bhambavali. Bharat, welcome to Brands and Marketing. And I thank you for being here with us uh, today. Uh, Bharat, I would like to start by asking you about your early years uh, in your profession and how did you happen to choose uh, marketing and advertising and brands uh, as an area of specialization in your career? Thank you, Shubroto. And it's a great pleasure to be with you on the show. My journey has been somewhat of an unusual one. It began uh, in advertising in 1985 and took me over a span of the last 35, 36 years over a number of countries, a number of continents and a number of roles all over the world. But the origin of this journey was with uh, India when I was here working with Ogilvy and Mehta. Now back Back when I was 26, my managing director at Ogilvy & Mehta, Mani Iyer, in consultation and discussion with Shunu Sen, then marketing controller of uh, what was then known as Hindustan Lever, which is now known as Hindustan Unilever, the two decided that somebody from Ogilvy should be seconded from Ogilvy to Unilever to work in the marketing group there to learn how Unilever did its marketing and return to Ogilvy to head up the Unilever business at Ogilvy. And at the age of 26, I was chosen and I was sent for a two year secondment at Hindustan Lever. I worked in the detergents group there and it was a very, very interesting, productive and a very high growth time for me. That was the time that I realized a lot of things about marketing. Bharat, uh, at that time, uh, as industry was uh, focusing on building brands, uh, you worked uh, with a large cast of very eminent uh, advertising uh, professionals and uh, they, 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 were, they, they actually crafted some great brands. Uh, why don't you just uh, tell me something about uh, them? Indeed, Mani Ayer was a legend and he was hugely influential in shaping many of my early views about advertising and marketing. But I also had the great pleasure and privilege of having been exposed to Shubhrato Sengupta when I was a year with Clarion before I went to Ogilvy. Uh, when Shubhrato uh, ran a workshop for us in Clarion, Mumbai on positioning which he was uh, very, very keenly involved with and led for us. And so that exposure to the idea of positioning from as illuminating a figure as Shubhrata Sengupta was very, very, very uh, useful and very inspiring in my life. Another advertising great that I met 
was Alec Padamsi. So when I finished at the Bajaj Institute of Management, I interviewed with him for a job at Lintas, which he gave me, but which I at that point in time didn't take. And I spent a wonderful hour with Alec in his office at Express Towers in Nariman Point, when we had wide ranging conversations about a whole range of topics, including, for example, how advertising builds brands. So Mani Ayer, Shubhrato Sengupta, uh, Alec Padamsi, and of course, later in my career, I spent a very long length of time with Ajay Shrikhande, uh, who was again, a huge influence and mentor on my marketing and advertising thinking. Can you just uh, walk us through some of the examples of great brands you worked with and the people you worked with uh, at the time? So there were many and uh, I would just single out a few of them, uh, not all of which I was associated with personally, but which I had the opportunity to witness because I was in the Ogilvy of that time. So those were the days, I'm talking about the late 80s and 90s, when brands were being built very, very fundamentally in India. Uh, Suresh Malik, who was the creative director of Ogilvy, and Piyush Pandey, who was the emerging star on the creative side of Ogilvy at that point in time, did a lot of work. I worked with Piyush very closely on the Unilever business, but independent of that, Piyush also did some wonderful work, uh, as did Suresh, for a number of brands. And to just mention a couple of them, those were the days that uh, Piyush did some very, very inspiring and interesting work on Fevicol, which launched that brand's idea and which the brand continues to adhere to even today. He did some great work on Luna in those days. With me, uh, Piyush and I did some great work on Asian paints. Uh, for example, uh, the campaign Celebrate with Asian paints, which brought the idea of home improvements and home decoration and attached it um, very, very closely with our Indian festivals. That was some work that also saw light at that time. Suresh on his part also did some wonderful work, for example, for the National Integration Mission uh, with his torch, which is Torch of Freedom and later on Mile Sur Mera Tumara. Mile Sur Mera Tumara to so those were some of the signature works that I could, you know, refer to of, of having been born in those days. Bharat, uh, to just wheel back, uh, you mentioned that you spent uh, two years uh, when you were in uh, O&M and uh, Mani Iyer had uh, uh, arranged a secondment for you uh, in Hindustan Leva where the legendary Shuno Sen was the marketing director. Now, that was a very forward-thinking uh, sort of practice on part of both O&M and uh, Hindustan Lever. And uh, uh, to get somebody who actually manage brands for them and embed them in their system uh, is something which uh, really paid very rich dividends. And since you're one of the few people who happened to get that uh, opportunity, uh, I'd be curious to know what exactly was that experience like? Uh, what were the areas of business that you uh, actually went and saw? And uh, what are your recollections of those uh, wonderful two years? Oh, absolutely. It was one of the most wonderful times of my life. I learned so much and uh, I had the opportunity to see so many things that the typical advertising person does not. For example, just understanding how brands can deeply entrench themselves into certain markets. Sunlight Detergent Powder, which was the brand that I was responsible for, was an immense brand in Bengal. And the entire state of Bengal took to that brand in a very deep way. And that was because the brand represented quality, but not at an uh, extraordinary price. And that sort of first led me to understand how brands can become culturally significant to certain segments of our country, whereas they might not have the same appeal in certain other parts of our country. So that was one, one early understanding of how brands become culturally relevant because they kind of fit a certain framework in consumers in a particular part of the world or a particular part of the country. But beyond that, to answer your question, I had occasion to visit uh, factories um, 
where sunlight powder was being made. I had the opportunity to go and uh, visit the uh, Hindustan Lever Training Center. I had occasion to visit the Research Center, which used to be where today the Hindustan Unilever head office in Mumbai is. That used to be the research center back in those days. And I got a chance to work with some very brilliant uh, chemists at uh, Hindustan Unilever to help craft product. The, the internal perfume, the perfumers who decided what kind of fragrances you gave brands and what kind of olfactory notes brought brands to life, they also sat at that point in time at the same location uh, with the research center and it gave me a great opportunity to interact with people who were masters at the craft of using sensory appeal to bring brands to life. So all those, all those experiences and all those exposures started to cook in my mind and started to make me a marketer who came from a very strong presence in the advertising and communication space but with a, with a wonderful exposure to so many things that makes brands. And last but not least, I would like to mention the whole marketing ops side of things. How do you get, how do you get brands into customers' hands? How do, you, how, how, how do you help customers overcome certain issues that they may face with brands? How does the sales and distribution system work? I had, I had a really wonderful opportunity to observe, participate and learn from wonderful and leading practitioners firsthand during those two, year, two years. Now, for those of you who are watching this program, I would like to uh, remind you that uh, sometime towards the eight, late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, globally, liberalization was the uh, watchword and markets around the world were dropping barriers and uh, globalization was uh, creating its own kind of idiom. And in early 1990s, a very large number of managers went and started working in China, in Asia Pacific, in West Asia, in Europe and North America. A large number of uh, managers uh, got the opportunity to go and build new businesses in these markets which were about to explode. Bharat, you were a part of that journey. And I am aware of the fact that uh, you had the opportunity to work with one of the most cerebral advertising professionals of our time, Ajay Shrikhande. And uh, tell me about how that happened and what that experience was like. Yes. After having been with Ogilvy for a number of years, having headed up the Unilever business for uh, nearly three and a half years and helping not just the brands that I originally started working on, but we, we, we started reading Dove for launch. We, started, we did the test market on comfort at that point in time. So after all those wonderful experiences, I was moved to uh, Chennai, then called Madras, of course, by Ogilvy, to head up the branch there. And it was at that point in time that Ajay, who had left India for Indonesia first and then moved to Dubai to set up the Lintas operation there, he got in touch with me and said, Bharat, I have a really unusual opportunity if you're interested, which is to become part of the founding, the core team of this agency and help set up this agency, the Lintas agency in the Middle East, based in Dubai, to service Unilever and other Lintas brands across Middle East, North Africa. So that sounded like a very interesting opportunity, not just because it would expose me to a new market, but because I had heard and known of Ajay for a very long time and I always wanted to work with him for some time. So one thing led to another and in 1993, uh, I moved to Dubai with my family and I started working with Ajay to look after large chunks of the Unilever business for Middle East, North Africa, but also to help him set up the agency working with our colleagues in the founding team then. Bharat uh, Unilever was uh, amongst the first uh, global companies which uh, decided to move manufacturing into what was then called emerging markets yeah. and Unilever Arabia was set up uh, and you were deeply involved in that business uh, uh, and that's, that's a very significant experience. Uh, can you just share with us uh, how that went and uh, what were the experiences in, in sort of uh, 
building that business bottom up. Yes, uh, when we got there, the Middle East, but specifically the Arabia region, uh, what was known as the GCC, but also other parts of the Middle East, they were a traded market. Unilever exports in Bristol would ship product out of the UK and other parts of the world into that geography. Similarly, Lintas Overseas, also based in the UK, would adapt or simply air commercials from other parts of the world, including the UK, in the Arabia region. Uh, what would principally happen is you would replace an English uh, soundtrack with a Arabic one, and that was the advertising. Now, all of us who have been in marketing for a long time know that that isn't a model that can survive for very long. And in fact, the reason why Unilever went on show when the initial, the first chairman of Unilever Arabia, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, he insisted that all the agencies come on shore, set up operations there, and start to immerse in the region and create consumer connections that were born in an understanding of the region and the culture. And I think from the Linta side, I can say that they couldn't have found a better person than Ajay to do that because Ajay was by nature such so committed to the cause of really consumer connecting communication. So what did we, what did we learn in those early days? The first things we had to look at was how to gently but firmly detach from an export mindset into an innovation, invention, creation mindset. And if you're going to say no to something, you have to be very clear about what you're asking somebody else to say yes to. And therefore, you have to really understand what is going on in the culture and what will create the brand connections that you're looking to establish. Uh, now, typically what happens is that you start to, uh, if you look at the, the, the circles of, of brands, at the center are, you look at customer needs, and around that are categories in which you have habits and attitudes, and outside that you have communication, which is trying to connect to habits and attitudes. Even the habit and attitude data was fairly out of date and you did not know, for example, how consumers in the home care category, how exactly they, they clean their houses, how exactly they wash their dishes. And so we did some very primary work at that point in time to understand how individual categories were consumed within Arab households. Now this extended to home, care products, it extended to personal care products, it is, and within personal care to beautification products, um, and so on. So that was one of the things. So tell me, what were the big brands uh, that you worked on uh, at the time uh, when uh, Lintaz was looking after the Unilever business uh, in, in Middle East? So we, we had a range of, of, of brands across a, a whole wide variety of categories. In laundry, we had Omo, which is known as Surf in India, which is the premium laundry detergent. And uh, in the home care category, we had Jif. So that was for bathroom and, and, and wash basins and cleaning, those kind of things. In, in the personal products, we had the oral care category. So we had uh, a, a couple of brands in the oral care category. Uh, we had uh, in face and beauty, we had Fair and Lovely, which was a very uh, remarkably interesting brand for that region. So that was another powerful thing. And in foods, we had a huge ice cream business with Unilever, uh, which included under the walls umbrella brand name, Magnum, Cornetto, and a whole bunch of other brands. Bharat, uh, you know, when we look back, uh over time, we normally speak about uh, all the successes uh, we've had. Uh, but along with that, there are several setbacks. Uh, I say that because uh, communication and advertising is very, very local in that uh, 
the, the history of the place, the food, the poetry, the literature, the music, the architecture, and uh, historicity of uh, and 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 the uh, uh, and, and and the cultural uh, nuances of a particular market are very complex. Each market is so different. So, how did uh, you manage uh, these uh, diverse uh, challenges as as all of you built uh, the business in uh, uh, Middle East? Yeah, the, we, we, and not everything was a success by any stretch of imagination, and in fact, uh, that was one of the uh, one of the interesting parts of being there at that time. That you know, you went in with a certain set of assumptions, and you found that uh, there were a number of reasons why that couldn't play out the way you imagined it. And I'll give you an example of uh, where it really sort of became powerful to. Uh, uh, to be able to understand where you have to go to really embed a brand. Um, now, as we know, the context of fairness, just speaking about Fair and Lovely, for example, the context of fairness in other markets, such as India, for example, uh, typically uh, the play out of the human story in a commercial about Fair and Lovely in India would kind of show how a girl who used the product found success in the romance space where a man, a man that she was interested in reciprocated her interest when he found her attractive. Okay? Now, I'm not going to comment on, on the sort of political correctness of that story, but that's the kind of communication that used to play in a market like India or indeed large parts of the world. In Arabia, because of the nature of that society, young women do not set out to try and win the heart of a man because there are certain social norms. There are certain ways in which that society operates. And well be it so. Is, I'm, I'm not someone to comment on what is right or wrong. But to understand that and to realize that the fairness context for a woman was the engagement and retention of her husband. So rather than fairness leading you to the completion of a romantic journey. It's a romantic journey that starts after marriage and takes place in a home and, 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 and where a, a, a young woman looks to escalate the intimacy with her husband through that route. Now, that was a, a fairly fundamental understanding of how it worked. Would you agree that that, that would really shape how, how things would be? So, after a long uh, uh, stint in the Middle East, uh, you moved to another market, uh, which was uh, Asia Pacific, uh, which is a very different market. Uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Hong Kong, uh, Philippines, uh, how, how Indonesia, Malaysia, how was your experience uh, and how did that happen? And how did you move to Asia Pacific and what did you do there? Yeah. So Middle East was a wonderful experience. I was there for a total of 10 years, but that included me uh, rising uh, through the system and then uh, being the managing director of Low and Partners Middle East North Africa for three and, uh, three and a half, four years. And then after that, uh, Low, uh, Lintas had, had been rebranded Low by then, Low wanted a head of the Unilever business for all of Asia Pacific. So I was selected for that role and I was uh, transferred from Dubai to Bangkok. And my footprint for the Unilever business, I was the Asia Pacific head of Unilever at low. It included the geography from Pakistan on the one end to Japan on the other. So the entire swathe of Asia. At that point in time, we had five or six huge categories. We had deodorants, we had toothpaste, we had laundry, we had, um, you know, uh, home care. We had huge categories, huge businesses with Unilever. And the job was to anchor the agency's performance on these brands while looking after one of the businesses myself. So I used to personally look after the uh, premium laundry business, Omo Surf in India. And in that role, I was part of the low global team on that business. And in my regional role, I was overseeing the entire relationship of our individual teams across the region with our individual clients and helping Unilever grow in Asia and our agency grow with it. So 
uh, after your Asia Pacific experience, uh, I gather that uh, you moved into a global role in that you started managing brands uh, which sold and were marketed across the world, uh, which is a very complex process. And uh, uh, can you just give us an insight into what happened and where did you move and what are the brands you handled and what were the challenges that you faced when you handled these brands? So while I was in Asia Pacific, uh, I was approached by, so yet another Unilever agency. So I had worked with Ogilvy on, on Unilever. I had then worked with Lintas slash Lowe on Unilever. And then JWT came to me and said that they needed some help at the global level, again on Unilever. And uh, of course, with the knowledge of many of our Unilever clients. So this is not uh, something that the Unilever uh, clients did not uh, appreciate and embrace. And I was moved to London with JWT uh, in 2007 to initially head up the Knorr business and then look after the hair care business for the world. So I looked after hair care uh, for all the countries. And at that point in time, among the many things that I did, I looked after, for example, the Lux brand in China and in Japan. Um, I looked after Sun Silk for the world, Timothy for Europe, and uh, you know th th those kind of hair assignments. So that's what kept me in London for the for the longest bit. Bharat, uh, at the time you were in London, uh, was also a time of great change for all large companies because uh, uh, you know. Emerging markets were becoming bigger and uh, there was strong growth coming in from China, from Middle East, from India, from Asia Pacific. And that brought uh, with it uh, a lot of opportunities and challenges. And uh, it will be interesting to know from where you were, how did uh, you look at brands which straddle different markets and cultures? Because uh, that's a very complex process. Yeah. So that was a... Uh, that's a very in interesting question, Shubhroto, because I, I had the, um, the involvement in actually seeing a lot change in that period of time in working across regions and uh, in the global team as well. Um, initially, Unilever used to be entirely local. Brands, they might have the same name in, in different countries, but they were managed in individual countries everything about them, how they were formulated, what they were called, how they were packaged, how they were sold, what they were advertised with. This was done in countries. And I was part of seeing that change where it went from being country led to being globally led. Country implemented, but globally led. And in order to achieve such a transition, uh, you have to go beyond thinking of the superficialities of the differences to try and understand the similarities and the commonalities that lie at the center of all customers and all consumers. And what you essentially do in that journey is you recognize what elements of marketing need to be done locally, such as advertising, because advertising has a cultural context in each country. So yes, of course, advertising needs to be local as much as possible, but the understanding of customers of what needs and wants they're fulfilling, how they're fulfilling those needs and wants, that can very much be universal. And therefore, when the brand is conceived from that core, the brand can travel across borders very comfortably, holding to its central meaning and its central identity. I just want to introduce a, a thought here that in my experience, I have found that all these large markets, which were at the time called emerging markets, had very serious local businesses and local brands. I'll give you a few examples. For example, in India, uh, Mr. Chauhan built uh, Parley Beverage and it had very strong brands like uh, Thumbs Up, for example, for um, Bisleri, for example. And the consumer franchise for these brands was very solid and, uh, you know, you couldn't get a crack at it. Thailand had some very strong uh, iced tea brands, for example, like Oishi. And uh, you could bang your head against them and uh, they were kind of rock solid. Uh, 
uh, what was your perspective and how did you see these uh, local brands? Because uh, there was at the time, uh, you know, an emerging technological parity and they did a pretty good job on their businesses. What was your experience in managing uh, an environment where there were these very strong local brands? Yeah. So much, much of the local brands, they may have a local insight, a local understanding of people in that culture because they belong to that culture. But their, but their products don't tend to be necessarily local. So if you, if, you, if you see a detergent manufacturer in India who does a laundry detergent manufacturer, he is going to manufacture it using similar chemicals to what a global company might do, right? He may use a slightly different process, but he will essentially, to achieve an outcome, the formulations that create those outcomes tend to be not very different. Then where do the differences come? The differences come in identity. The differences come in understanding human beings. The differences come in understanding how human beings connect to products. The understanding comes from the recognition that pro products may solve certain requirements that people have, but brands help them achieve life outcomes. Bharat, after 20 years of uh, having uh been in West Asia, in Asia Pacific, and then looking after global brands out of London, uh, you took a decision which was quite uh, interesting in that you chose to move from advertising and walk across to managing a brand which was very large, which is Airtel, which is one of our iconic brands. And uh, you did a very, very good job out there. So just give me an idea as to how that happened. Now, when you came to India, what was your experience like? And uh, tell us something about that business. You know, after 20 years or close to 20 years in different parts of the world, uh, I was really looking for something new, my next challenge. And it was remarkable that at that point in time, uh, the Airtel company and more specifically, uh, chairman of Airtel, Sunil Mittal, reached out to me and enthused me to the idea of coming back home to India. This was in 2011 and working on the Airtel brand, which is one of the first Indian brands to be looking to go global. I would say the first, it was one of the early uh, bunch of brands from India that were looking to go global. Now, as, as a very proud Indian, as somebody who had carried the torch of our identity all around the world, continue to have our passport and continue to this day to have our passport, it came as a very interesting challenge to say, Hi, wouldn't that be great to go back to India and be the first global brand director of one of our Indian brands and see how we can take Airtel to more countries. And that challenge and the, and the wonderful company that Airtel is and the wonderful person that Sunil is attracted me. And in 2011, I came back to India to join Airtel as global brand director. Now, uh, the Indian telecom story is something that we are, we are very, very proud of. And the brand which led the charge was indeed Airtel, where you worked. And uh, you were the custodian of the brand for a long time. Uh, my question is that what were the challenges that you faced? Because you were up against uh, some very significant competition from Vodafone and from Reliance at the time. And it must have been a very difficult uh, assignment to, to recruit consumers as to go back to a theoretical construct and to retain them under some very furious competitive pressure. Uh, can you just tell us something about that? So the brand Airtel had had a really wonderful and remarkable journey. 1995, when the brand started out, it was one of the early pioneers of the mobility boom and it had had a wonderful 15 years. The brand had done really well. However, at the time that I joined the brand, the definition of the problem that Sunil said he wanted me to solve was that the brand was now starting to look like it belonged to somebody who was in his 50s. The brand was starting to look like it was aging. Remarkable though it sounds that a 15, it was only a 15 year old brand. And we know there are brands in the world which have lasted past centuries. But remarkable, because of the nature and the ebullience and the continuing change in the Indian market, 
There were other brands which were starting to appeal to younger consumers, principal among them Vodafone. So the brand challenge, the marketing challenge was not just about product development and all which was happening in Plentiful, but how do you take this big, large, powerful brand which is looking like it's aging and where young consumers, which is really the largest uh, demographic in our country, they are starting to identify with another brand. And so the work we did was to connect the Airtel brand to India's youth and to ready it for the data revolution that was to come. और फ्रेंडशिप की शेयरिंग को हमेशा ऑन रखें एयरटेल इंटरनेट भरत आई वॉन्ट शिफ्ट गेयर लिटल बिट यू हैड बिन अवे फ्रॉम इंडिया फॉर अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम टेल मी हाउ हैड द इंडियन मार्केटिंग एंड बिजनेस लैंडस्केप चेंज It was indeed a, a terrific homecoming. I, I was very, very happy to be back in India. I was looking forward to the challenge of, you know, working in India and, you know, looking at uh, Indian problems, looking at brands from an Indian perspective, just as much as, if you remember, I had come to do a global role, so to take our brands internationally. But to focus on India, as, as your question uh, asked me to, um, we had had a proliferation of brands in all categories as you mentioned but one of the big changes i saw was that marketing had increasingly become expeditious and tactical perhaps because there had been many years of rapid growth people were in the let's do it let's do it quickly let's do it quickly kind of mode and when the primary drivers of marketing decision making are about speed and about tactics something starts to give and it is helpful to take a step back from the tactics and from the speed to market and from the doing things quickly to say why are we doing these things in the first place and how can we do them better through a better fundamental understanding fundamental understanding of people and marketing now where i found this problem was most acute was among our younger indian marketers and i could understand why that was the case because those people who had spent 5 years 10 years in the in the in the profession had only ever seen expeditious marketing they had only ever seen tactical marketing so i realized that we had some great talent in our country lot of it had through the boom in india risen to the top the talent that was coming up from below had perhaps one or two dimensions of marketing that were not as well filled in as one would have hoped in the interest of the country and in the interest of brands and in the interest of marketers uh, bharat let's get on to uh, the more uh, kind of uh, philosophical part of business which is people uh because indian industry had seen such high growth uh and uh, the markets kind of exploded all over the place there was one feature which i noticed uh, and i want to get your perspective on it which is that the the, the custodians of the brand the brand managers uh, they were on the brand for a very short time because either they were getting promoted or they were getting uh, they were changing jobs and moving on to other brands so the brand got uh, compared to the previous uh, years it got shorter attention from an individual brand manager and on the other side of the equation were the advertising agencies companies started changing advertising agencies uh, more frequently than they did in the past in the past perhaps they never changed advertising agencies and equally the account uh, managers who used to handle the brand they also were Uh, the beneficiaries of this high growth and therefore they would uh, kind of change jobs or move on or move outside india so in the process the brand was being handled by many people over shorter durations of time which impacted them and uh, this must have had uh, its own consequences 
So yeah. what are your thoughts around this? Yes, I, I would share that assessment, yeah. Uh, see, people grew in title, people grew in geographic or number of brands responsibility, and people grew in in terms of perhaps their remuneration and what and and you know how their, their lifestyles and so on and all those are good things because i'm sure they would have been well earned but i don't think we grew in terms of the competencies that we developed in marketing particularly in strategic marketing yeah and uh, and, and, you know, I, I, when I reflect on these, I, I see four or five factors that contribute to this alongside the ones that you've already mentioned. One, one is you contextualize this whole conversation in the growth of business. And when business grows, the demand for people grows rapidly. And India's business growth sucked in all the good talent that it could and still wanted more. So at entry levels, People who would come into businesses, who would typically come from business school, we suddenly required many more of them. And so there was an expansion and a growth in the number of business schools, where they were located, uh, the kind of people that were getting into business school also increased. But the talent in terms of being able to groom these young students at B school was not as abundant as you're required to have a consistent increase in the level. Secondly, when some of these students entered their workplaces, one of the places where you really learn a lot is from your mentors at the workplace. I've been privileged to learn so much from my mentors, several people over the years who've shown me the way. The mentor was not as evident anymore as there used to be in the past because the manager had gone up the system very rapidly and he didn't have time to mentor people. So that was one reason. Uh, another reason is that, you know, in the past, companies like uh, Hindustan Unilever, companies like Procter & Gamble, companies like uh, what used to be, you know, Gla uh, uh, Smith Klein Beecham, which became Gla GlaxoSmithKline. Companies like these were the, if you like, the real universities of marketing. ITC, you know, a host of such companies. When young people joined those companies, they learned so much while they were there. And those companies have really given a large amount of enormously, uh, you know, skilled and wonderful people to the Indian marketing space. But the more recent arrivals for or MNCs, they are not like the universities of marketing of the past. Many of them, they run their businesses from overseas. They export their strategies from overseas. They even perhaps guide what is supposed to happen in India from overseas. So where is our young Indian talent going to learn in, a, in the MNC of today as they did in the MNC of yesterday of, of, of which many of us are beneficiaries of that learning. So these are some of the factors which I feel have created a, a vacuum of sorts in the strategic marketing understanding of some of our younger marketeers. Uh, the markets are facing headwinds as we speak and uh, yeah. a lot of people are trying to wrap their minds around this problem yeah. and how to get back to high growth. Now, if you were speaking to a whole bunch of young marketing professionals, uh, what would you suggest to them uh, that they consider as a marketing construct in their mind to find solutions to the problems that they are facing? That's a great question, Chubrato. Uh, if, if you look at uh, the core, the, 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 the purpose of business as you originally uh, defined it, it is that the purpose of business is to create and keep a customer. Now, when you just leverage that thought a bit further, the purpose of marketing is to create and keep a customer. Now, how do you create and keep a customer? Now, you do that with some, the starting point of creating and keeping a customer 
is to understand people. Understand people not just from the point of view of a category, but a more fundamental understanding of people. And that fundamental understanding of people is about their motivations. Why do people buy anything? Why do they buy anything? And when you drive down into those kind of understandings of people, why people buy? You can then start from there to overlay your category or your brand or whichever company you're working for and to say that, okay, I fundamentally now understand that what people are doing when they buy my brand is to fulfill this or these set of motivations. That conversation, I don't see a lot of happening right now. And I think that would be great to see happening that a little bit, that happening a little bit more. In fact, everyone starting, especially the young marketers we are talking about, starting with a fundamental understanding of what, what is it that makes people buy. Yeah. My next question related to the previous one is that uh, the crux of, from, from, from creating a marketing construct, uh, you have some thoughts on how yeah. the brand should be crafted. So the, the crafting of a brand is uh, one of the greatest joys and one of the greatest challenges of being in marketing. But I just want to lead you up, uh, up to that model by a little, little bit of brief kind of look back at how we've come to where we have now, right? At the beginning, way back, let's say at the turn of the century, not this century, but the 1900s, we had what I describe as commodities with names. So you had a tooth or a, a oral care product and that was called Colgate. So you had a commodity and it had a name and very often it was the name of the manufacturer or the main man who invented it. When these started to proliferate and multiply, you came to positioning where products were positioned with certain benefits. When positioning in itself began to not produce the differentiation we're looking for, we advanced to the time of brand ideas. Yeah. So we came to the world of, of brand ideas where a, a brand like, you know, for example, the, the RIN detergent brand, RIN washes whitest. Uh, uh, that kind of brand idea or if you take the Surf India brand idea that quality is actually better value. We came to the world of brand ideas. Yeah, That was the period of brand ideas. We're talking about the 80s, early 90s. After that, we came to the time of brand ideals when brands like Obo started saying dirt is good. Dove, Dove started saying real beauty. So it came to brand ideals where, where brands were beginning to observe their benefits through a social or a larger life perspective. Now that's, that's been the history. Where are we now? Lo lots has changed. Fundamental among it is that the balance of power, if you like, between brands and customers has now moved from brands to customers. You are no longer the brand that you announce you are, you are the brand that customers perceive you to be, believe you are, experience you as through your actions. And therefore, brands can no longer be about marketing additions. They have to be about authenticity. And therefore, today is the time of brand authenticity when customers look at your brand, when they assess your brand, everything about the brand feels authentic. And my model of, my model of brands, which, uh, which is what I believe is fundamental for our times, is authentic brands which are very, very well crafted across all the eight interfaces with which brands actually reach out to people. The performance interface, in terms of what you actually deliver, the product interface, pricing, service, storytelling, customer experience, and people and planet.
all these coming together authentically is where brands are today. There is one challenge which everyone faces, which is taking the brand to market Indeed. and to consumers. Now, this is uh, one of the most uh, significant parts of the, of, the, of the stage gate, as it were. And uh, very often we find that some great brands didn't do well because of poor execution. I mean, great strategy with poor execution yeah. is a recipe for failure. Uh, I just wanted your thought on what you feel should be the guardrails that people should watch out for when yeah. they're taking brands to market. I'd, I'd like to just talk about two dimensions of this because this is, as you know, a vast subject. And uh, without touching upon uh, the physical or the marketing upside side of this, such as like distribution and so on, let's look at some of the principles that guide going to market. Whenever, whenever you go to market, you're going to take a customer through four boxes, depending on satisfaction and the exit barrier that your brand has. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that. The first box is brand, uh, customers become dippers. They dip into your brand and they kind of trial it. They see what they think of it and so on. After having tried your brand a little bit, if they really like it, they become desirers. Now, desirers are people who have a high level of satisfaction and have a even though exit barriers are low, they still stay in your brand because they desire you. Then, after having become desirers and having interaction with your brand, getting to another level, they become devotees. Only your brand will do. So they have a high degree of satisfaction and they don't exit, they don't exit your brand because they have created exit barriers for themselves. And the last category are people with low satisfaction but who can't exit your brand and those are people who are detainees. No brand wants people stuck with them or no customer wants to be stuck with a brand because he has no choice. You might remember some, some years ago, uh, because in India we give our mobile number to so many government services, so many banking services, even if you're with a service provider that did not satisfy your needs, you, because your mobile number was with many, many such utilities, you could not exit that brand because you could not change your mobile number. That would be a classic detainee. But with the arrival of number portability, you're no longer a detainee, you can actually move on. So that was just to give you an example of what a detainee is. Brands, brands typically want to have desirers and devotees. Now, how do you create more desires and devotees? That's by, uh, just one other thought, by managing the moments of truth. Moments of truth are when the brand and a customer comes together and there's a fundamental exchange of information and DNA, if you like, between the two. And this is far more deep than simply packaging and branding and adver advertising and so on. If you manage your mom, yeah, yeah. So let me let me just let me just spend a few more seconds, a few more minutes on that. Brands which manage the moments of truth, such that they have many moments of magic between customer and brand, will more consistently have desires and devotees. Brands which create moments of misery or even, if not misery, simply mediocrity in the moment of truth between customer and brand, they are likely to have dippers or detainees in greater proportions. And therefore, the approach should always be, I have to manage those moments between me and my customer to create a moment of magic. It's not just presence. It's not just being present at the touch point. It is converting that into a moment of magic and trying to minimize and avoid the moments of misery and the moments of mediocrity. So these are ideas that help you when you go to market. Indian markets have become very large uh, 
and doing business in India is pretty expensive. So the room for error has diminished. Uh, Indian media has proliferated. We've got hundreds of television channels. Social media has become very, very powerful. Digital is has brought in its own dynamics. And uh, this entire landscape is pretty complex and daunting for anybody who looks at this market and wants to make a meal out of it. So my question to you is that if you were speaking to a bunch of bright young men and women who are considering choosing marketing and brands as a specialization and a career option, uh, what would your uh, thought be to them, uh, which they could consider as a guardrail around which they, uh, they, they look at uh, building brands? What I basically mean is that if you were to be talking to a bunch of young men and women who are considering brands and marketing as a specialization uh, and a career choice, what were the few themes that they would you would ask them to focus on to ensure that uh, the chances of success in whatever they are doing goes up? I think I would love to see a return to the basics in Indian marketing. I would love to see people stopping talking about media or tactics. You know, for example, I would uh, love to see some of our younger people in particular go back to saying, I want to fundamentally understand how or why people buy. And I want to build that understanding in the way I create my marketing strategy. You know, I'll tell you, just to give you an example, I'm sometimes in a room with some of our younger marketeers and they say, in the first meeting, they say, okay, on social, we're going to do this. And on Instagram, we're going to do that. And on, you know, uh, LinkedIn, we're going to do this. And I say, okay. All that is fine and very well, and I'm sure we need to do those things. But on what customer understanding, on what clarity of connection between our brand and the customer, and on what strategy are we basing this? And I think this would be, uh, this, this return to the fundamentals, return to the basics, could be a wonderful way for us to reboot our marketing, and indeed reboot our economy. So I'll circle back to where we started, uh, which is that, uh Indian economy at the time is facing uh, some headwinds uh, and a uh, lot of people are trying to find a solution uh, and Bharat is eminently qualified to tell the story and as it happens uh, he's written a marvelous book and I would recommend uh, that you read this book. Bharat, uh, congratulations for having read, written this book. I really thank you for your insights and the way you explained and touched upon some very complex issues. You made it sound simple, but I think you have thought through it and it is important that we listen and reflect over many of the things that you have said. Thank you, Shubrato. Delightful being with you. Thank you very much. My show is about your story and I'm listening.